And we're joined by Stephen Fuhr, our former MP in Kelowna Lake Country. And also you chaired the National Defense Committee that at one point was making recommendations on how to fund the military in Ukraine. So it puts you in a position to really have an informed look at what's going on in Ukraine. So when you're seeing all of this unfold, tell me the first thing that comes to mind. Well, it's incredibly tragic and there's, there's, um, yeah, it's a global event and there's some really, really nasty consequences going on for the people of Ukraine. Um, to your earlier point in your intro, so I was the chair of the National Defense Committee in the 42nd Parliament, um, so 2015, 16 to 2019. And at the end of 2017, we did go to Ukraine as part of a, a trip that we were doing overseas, studying NATO, although Ukraine wasn't part of the NATO discussion. We were in the vicinity uh, and and we saw value in, in, in going to Ukraine and, and helping bring the issue to the surface, given, you know, in 2017, 2018, they were still four years into a, a war that was being actively fought in Eastern Ukraine with the Russians, right? So, I mean, we went to see what the Canadian troop contribution was, what Canada was doing for Ukraine, and it, it was doing a lot. And at the time, I think other than the US, Canada had the biggest footprint in Ukraine. And, and you know, up till now, we spent pretty near a billion dollars in supporting Ukraine. So we have done a lot for Ukraine. There's no question about it. Um, if I was going to be critical of our support, one of our recommendations after we wrote a report up after our visit, there were 17 recommendations, was to provide Ukraine with defensive weapons, uh, specifically anti-tank weapons. And that was, I think there was a caveat with that, but there was, it was an all party re report. We all agreed, NDP, conservatives and liberals amongst the other 17 things that we recommended. And uh, that hadn't happened until very recently. And to be fair, they were asking for a lot of different countries to provide them with this type of weaponry and nobody was doing it. So that doesn't excuse it. It, it is difficult to look back now and say that, you know, that, that was the right decision because it, it, it's not. We should, right. have, we should have been amping up defensive weaponry for Ukraine for years and, and it just didn't happen. Okay, uh, how would you say Canada has done uh, since the inevitable uh, invasion? I think they've done well and, and I can say a couple things. I think, like I said, we've contributed about a billion dollars to date from 2014 after uh, Crimea and the Donbass was annexed or taken by the Russians. And um, as of recently, we, we are sending defensive weapons to Ukraine uh, in, a, in a pretty big way. There's some number, numbers out this, this morning, which is some pretty big numbers on there and stuff that they actually need. Um, we sanctioned the Russian energy sector, which is a big controversial discussion right now. Um, Canada did that. We weren't importing a lot of Russian oil. I think two, three, four percent, right. which wasn't big, but it's this is this is uh, something that has to happen, in my opinion. Okay, so Canada has done that. We did it seven days ago. There are other nations that you would argue could, but aren't. Sure, the states hasn't done it yet. They're talking about it. Uh, I think this morning Germany's come out and just said we just can't. We're just too dependent on it. It's still winter. Do you buy that? I, I, I do. I think that, well, they can do anything they want. I think right. they have to weigh it off against what's going on over there. It's still winter. But over there's there. other countries that you would say that truly could, that need to make that sure. step. The U.S. is a great example. I think it's 8% of, of their intake and they could cut it off tomorrow. And they, and I think they should. Okay. So all of these sanctions, they're getting a chokehold on Putin, but do you have any sense that that truly discourages him? No, no. I don't. Just look at the evidence. I mean, as as incredible as it is that the global community has come to the aid of Ukraine, and they really have, in sanctions, corporations pulling, like, it, they're, they're, their economy is the size of Zimbabwe right now, right? The swift banking system thing. All these things that have happened have happened relatively quickly, and, and the scale of it is is impressive. But if you weigh that off against its effectiveness, it's ineffective. As impressive as it sounds, it isn't stopping Putin. He's just ramping up, ramping it up. So, you know, some of the things that we, we, the global community, have been slow to do is is really cut, like really cut off his income, which is which is energy. And some countries will have a better ability to do that than others. But those that can, with with relatively little impact, should do it right now. And right. and then the, those that are struggling with it need to weigh it off against. Gee, a few days ago we were talking about a nuclear power plant that was on fire because it was attacked by the Russians in Ukraine. Well, guess what? There's a bunch of NATO countries that border Ukraine and if the wind blows the right direction, that becomes a problem for everybody. So 
they need to weigh off the little bit of pain you know the countries are going to you know face or feel by sanctioning russian energy against the actual situation ukrainians are getting killed in mass numbers there, there's a whole bunch of bad things going on this is not slowing down it's it is actually ramping up and i think it, everyone needs to come to the party and now do it now right and I guess eventually that puts the squeeze on the people in Russia, which I, which is unfortunate. Fr but from our earlier conversation, it sounds to me that in in your view, the the only viable end game here is for for things within Russia to uh, end Putin's reign of terror. It, it's it seems like the highest probability that everyone's staring at right now. Um, some Dis kind of a despite, coup yeah, or an uprising yeah, yeah, yeah. within Russia. Despite a, some sort of surprise that no one sees, is, is some sort of coup. And, and there was a, a coup attempt in 1991, so it, it's a possibility. Or a civilian uprising to the scale that's just uncontrollable. Like I'm talking millions of people in the streets. And there's a number of ways to motivate that. It's becoming progressively more difficult because Putin's just shut off all the incoming well, media. Right. So the it's, only it's thing... It's a people... total media blackout. Plus, sure. uh, we were discussing this earlier, he still enjoys... <laughs> a pretty uh, large amount of support. In, right. in his own borders, because again, the, the people have just been fed this narrative for so long, and now they've shut off all the incoming stuff, like all the social media has been shut down, all the uh, independent media has been shut off with threats of 15 year prison sentences. People that go up on the, out on the streets to protest are getting scooped up and put in you know jail temporarily and, and threatened. I mean, it is he's actually got a pretty big um, problem internally, and that, that problem needs to get a lot bigger to motivate someone to take take them out of decision making. Because, and, and the scary thing is, and we've talked about this too, is that over the past several days, he's really taken away from himself, Putin, any kind of kind of off ramp that he could have right. had. He's yeah. a war criminal right. now, right? I heard you speaking on another media outlet and you were talking about trying to preserve some sort of off ramp so he could save a bit of face sure. and just and just peel off from this. But it, we're, we're past that now and it, we're past it, that it seems now. like we're dug in. This could take a long time. It could take a long time. I think um, the economic sanctions, you know, the maximum that we can put on Russia needs to happen like right now. And that, that's essentially their energy sector. I think that we need to be, i.e. the allies need to be talking to China for a couple of reasons. One, they're a global power. They seem to be sitting on the fence. They're not in the, in the Russia camp, but I mean, they, they abstained from the UN vote on, on uh, condemning this Russian aggression in Ukraine. They abstained there. They're kind of, if you listen to what's coming out of, out of China, they're kind of not trying not to take a position. But if we start pulling like corporations, it's happening now, and we sanction the energy sector, there's going to be a vacuum there. We don't want China to go in there and try and satisfy that vacuum, right? Right. So getting China on board and sanctioning their energy sector, you know, and, and continuing uh, to to try and get reality using technology into Russia to educate the reasonable what the heck's going on outside their borders. There's one bit of ground I want to cover for sure because we hear the Ukraine saying repeatedly, um, declare the no-fly zone. And, you know, I think everybody wants to say yes to whatever the Ukraine is asking for. They're saying, we want the no-fly zone, but the answer has been no. Explain why that's not considered a possibility well, you, for NATO. I, yeah, sure. I mean, I think NATO is looking at it as, as a risk-reward situation. I mean, you could, I could probably argue at some point there might have been an opportunity to do that. I think that possibility has come and gone. Maybe before the conflict even started, so it would look like a defensive move? Per perhaps. But at this argument. point, it's... I mean, the fear is to escalate this up so, so uh, you know, Putin feels that like he's in a corner and he's got to use a nuclear weapon. That's the fear. So at the point we declare a no-fly zone, then it becomes a conflict between NATO and Russia at war. Sure, but I mean... But I think what people don't, don't understand is declaring a no-fly zone isn't just saying, hey, no more aircraft here. There's actual there's action that has to be taken to secure the no fly it's, zone it's, it's a complicated military thing could they could nato do it they could again would they're it, waiting would it, would it mean they would they'd have to bomb some of the anti-aircraft sure. capability of russia and, so and, it's, it becomes an offensive and it doesn't solve all the problems either because a lot of the damage that's happening right now is from artillery so there hasn't been a massive air com campaign we see right. you know some aircraft have been going in there they don't they don't have um Russia doesn't have something called air supremacy. They have air superiority, okay. which means that the airspace is still contested. And I guess, you know, NATO is looking at this going, nobody wants to 
amp this up more. Right. And they're just looking at it from a, a risk, risk reward. reward. Yeah. So, so we're risking amping this up to World War Three, and at the same time, even if we were to succeed in getting it in place, it doesn't solve. It doesn't all solve the all the problems anyway. It, Sure, it, that's probably the best way to look at it. There, there's lots of things that still can be done, and um, anti-tank weapons are, are getting in there. What they, about aircraft? It's it's tough. So um, you hear a lot on the news about Stinger missiles. They're very effective, um, but, but they have limitations in altitude and range. So they're great for helicopters, because helicopters don't really have an ability to get away from them. If you fly into an envelope that's called the weapons engagement zone of a, of a Stinger and you're in a helicopter, there's no, you can't get away from it. You're not going to outrun right. it. You're not going to fly above it. Airplanes, you've seen some Ukrainians shoot down um, Russian fighter jets and some other types of fixed wing airplanes. The Stinger's effective there, but once the um, Russians figure out that that threat has grown because there's so many Stingers in there, they'll just fly above the threat. Because I think the weapon's only probably effective to 12 or 15,000 feet, and the jets will right. just come in higher than that. Okay, so you flew F 18s. Yes. Can we just give them some F 18s? No. Um, Why not? Because unlike a car, there's there's you a, can't just get behind them. No, you you got to be trained on the airplane. So there's a lot of talk right now about Poland, who flies uh, both F-16s and MiG-29s, are phasing out their MiG-29s and they're buying F-35s and they're going to fly F-35s and F-16s. Bottom line is they have an inventory of MiG-29s. They're willing or want to or talking about, I should say, giving the Ukrainians the MiG-29s because they could literally just get in them and fly them because right. they're trained on them. They know how they work. Um, and, and there's some talk about that happening. And I think they should pursue that. The, the, the reality is though, is that um, unlike a helicopter that can take off and land anywhere and is relatively easy to support, these fighter airplanes are not easy to support. They need a certain amount of runway, big infrastructure. And, and once, if this was to occur and Russia was feeling a threat from these MiG-29s, they just take out they the airports. They take out the airports right away. Right away. And the, and the reason they probably haven't already is because their plan was to come and take Ukraine and then use the airports that were there to bring in their own stuff. But if 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 there's a MiG-29 threat all of a sudden resurrected out of Ukrainian airports, my guess is that they're going to take the airports out and they could do that in a matter of minutes. Okay, so if we can't send them aircraft, are we doing enough of uh, sending other uh, weapons of war so they can defend themselves as best they can? Well, I think, yeah, I think that the, the 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 criticism is this should have happened earlier. There's no question about it. You can't. No one can look at this and say that we shouldn't. We being the allies, everyone that's supporting Ukraine shouldn't have done this months or even years ago. Okay, but that's a mistake that's been made. What are we doing now? Well, yeah, Canada. This morning I was looking at what Canada's contribution was. It's like 4,500 rocket propelled grenades, 100 Carl Gustavs. The states have sent them 17,000. Uh, anti-tank weapons, Norway, Germany r totally changed its policy on, on exporting weapons. So sure, there's lots of will out there, but the challenge is how do you get it there? Right, 4,500 4, RPGs. RPGs. Uh, we were talking earlier, I know, how do they work? This is a one-use anti-tank yeah, well, weapon? Yeah, well, the Carl Gustafs are a little more sophisticated and they're multiple use and they have different warheads and they're a little more accurate and a little longer range. But the, but the other ones, I think they're called the, they're called LAW, L-A-W. They're single use. They're just a kinetic energy point and shoot weapon. They're very effective in close quarters um, and they will add value. There's no question. And they don't require a ton of training. I mean, they're maybe not as accurate because they don't have optical sighting and all this kind of stuff. But Guess what? You don't need a ton of training, and they do work. So it will—it's a—it's a nice—it's a, nice, a big contribution, and so this stuff's getting in there. But how do you get it there, right? That's it's, right, yeah. it's not happening quick, quick enough. So it's becoming harder and harder to even watch what's happening in the Ukraine right now, and I shouldn't say the Ukraine, in Ukraine. Um, how do you process it when you see, you know, women and children and and apartment buildings being bombed? I think I don't, it, it seems almost surreal because we're so far away from it. I mean, I feel a little more attached to it because I, I went there not too long ago and, and spent a ton of time at committee with the Ukrainian ambassador and Moldova and Georgia ambassadors coming. We, we felt as a committee, um, you know, 2016, 17, 18, 19, that, that because of the misinformation and, and cyber type threat Russia was flooding Ukraine with that we wanted to give uh, them a platform to talk about the realities of what was happening there. I mean, they've been in an active war since 2014. 15,000 Ukrainians have been killed. 
and it's largely not been on anybody's no. mind over here, realistically. It's news to people to sure. know that there's really been a smoldering war that's been going it's on. It's been going on for a long time. So we felt value uh, in giving them the opportunity to talk about this and elevating it in, in, the, in the minds of you know North America and Canadians. We have I think, nearly, nearly a million and a half of Ukrainians live in Canada. Um, so we have a big Ukrainian population here. We've always supported Ukraine. A number of our senior politicians are of Ukrainian descent. And, and to be fair, Canada has done a lot. I, I mean, I'm somewhat critical of this defensive weapon thing. I think it should have happened earlier, but to be fair, right. nobody was doing it when they should have. So it is, you know, we're, we are where we are now and we are, we, the government is, is doing a lot. And, you know, from what I'm seeing in the media, it, when it comes to sanctions, like SWIFT, SWIFT banking system, although there's problems there too, we were talking earlier that, you know, apparently there's up to 300 banks that could be affected by this yeah. in Russia and it's only like seven or eight or nine or 10. Maybe, maybe today it's 15, but it's not as devastating. As right, so th that, that banking thing could be upscaled a bit. It could be upscaled. But the, my, yeah. my point with the politicians is that, that Canada, again, this is not coming from Canada necessarily. I've been watching a bunch of different media sources. Is that, you know, Christia Freeland and, and others have, have really been pressing the test on, on these issues. So, you know, we're rallying our allies and our, and our, and our friends to, to do what we can. And even that sanctioning Russian energy, when the Prime Minister did that a week ago, um, that just sends a signal that, hey, listen, it's time for everyone to do what they can. And if, you, if the states can cut off 8% of its Russian import, they should do it. If this ends up going on for months and months, there, uh, there's going to be even more refugees. Is Canada doing enough, in your view, to take its share? I don't. I anticipate they will. I don't. I'm not. Uh, I didn't see anything uh, in the in the headlines that suggested that we're we've identified a number that we're prepared to take, and that we set up a, a transportation situation where that we can t bring them over in C-17s or whatever. I don't know. I would, I would be very, very confident in saying that there's probably discussions about that right now, because. This, as of this, this morning, I think it's 1.7 million people have fled the country. And it's, what, 150,000 a day? That number's not going to get smaller. Um, it'll probably, I mean, there's a lot of people here. And I don't necessarily think Europe can absorb everybody. And Canada can do its share there, too. Yeah. Doesn't seem like this is going to be over quickly. No. no. Well, thanks for your insights. Anything that you wanted to... No, say I, that I haven't. No, thanks for of. the opportunity. I, I think it's important, and you know, when we talk about, um, you know, I, I feel it too. I go to the gas station and I see, I see increased prices and in fuel, and then, you know, nobody's happy about that. But that we know what this is, what's driving that, and um, you know, everyone's everyone's going to have to do their part, no matter how big or how small, to help kind of get this sorted out. And you know, hopefully, the government can help in ways to ease some of the financial pain, but. This conflict, although it's on the other side of the planet, is going to affect us, and, and its effect is not going to get any smaller. It's going to get bigger. Right. And thanks again for coming in. Stephen Thanks, here. Thank you for watching Kelowna Now.